Indeed, even in the most complex crimes, a small detail can be the key to solving it. Sometimes criminals feel confident thinking that they have no chance of being caught. However, as experience shows, even the smallest traces or details can be decisive in solving a crime. An interesting point is that the information received from an already deceased person became the solution to a terrible crime four decades later. Such details may be hidden and invisible at first glance, but the police using modern methods and technology can solve even the most carefully planned crimes. Michelle Martinko was born on October 6, 1961 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Martinko, the younger of two daughters born to Albert Martinko and Janet Martinko, attended Cedar Rapids Kennedy High School. Described as an above-average student, she garnered esteem from school authorities. Michelle showcased her talents as a performer, participating in the twirling squad during her sophomore year and engaging in choirs and theater productions. Despite her achievements, Michelle's social circle was not extensive and she lacked close girlfriends or confidants. Speculation arose that this limited social circle could be attributed to jealousy from peers due to her beauty and fashionable attire. Additionally, conflicts over a boy she had dated were considered as potential factors contributing to the absence of close friendships in her life. After high school, Michelle planned to attend Iowa State University and become an interior designer. Except that dream would never come true. On the evening of December 19, 1979, she attended an evening of the Kennedy Concert Choir at the Sheraton Inn. She wore a black jersey dress, a black scarf, black tights and heeled shoes. On top, she wore a white and brown waist-length rabbit fur jacket and grabbed a brown leather purse. After the event was over, she asked her friend if she wanted to keep her company and go shopping at the newly opened Westdale Mall, where Martinko worked. The friend declined, so Michelle went shopping alone. She had $186 in her purse, which she planned to spend on a new winter coat. Being there, she went shopping, talked to acquaintances who also worked in the shopping center. She was last seen between 8 and 9 o'clock in the evening, near a store with jewelry. By 2 a.m., Martinko had not returned home, and her father reported her missing. Together with the police, the father began searching for his daughter. At 4 a.m., police located Martinko's family car, a brown and green Buick Electra. It was parked in the northeast corner of the mall parking lot. Michelle's body was lying on the passenger seat. She had been stabbed. Investigators counted 29 stab wounds on her face, neck, and chest. The wounds on her arms were self-defense wounds. Since there was no blood outside the vehicle, it became clear that Michelle was killed right in the car. A subsequent autopsy revealed that her death occurred between 8 and 10 o'clock in the evening. The murder weapon was a stabbing and cutting object, not necessarily a knife. Its size could not be established because the police did not find fingerprints at the crime scene, they assumed that the killer acted with gloves. Money was found in Michelle's purse, so the robbery version was ruled out. All the Michelle clothes were intact. It was also determined that she had not been sexually assaulted, but police believed the motive could still have been sexual, and Michelle had struggled so much that the perpetrator might not have been able to carry out his original plan. Police deemed the crime a personal count murder, based on the number and locations of the stab wounds. Despite the police obtaining blood scrapings from the car's gear shift and discovering a blood spot on Michelle's black dress, it's important to note that DNA analysis in 1979 was not as accurate as it is today. The technological limitations of that era meant that the investigation didn't benefit from the advanced DNA testing methods available now. Even though Michelle was observed by multiple people inside the mall and had parked her car there, no witnesses came forward to confirm seeing her inside her car or witnessing anyone approaching her during that time. The lack of such testimony added a layer of mystery to the events surrounding Michelle's tragic case. One of the initial individuals questioned by the police was Andy Seidel, Michelle's former boyfriend. 
Michelle and Andy crossed paths when she was 15 at a roller skating rink, with him being just a year older. They were in a relationship for two years, but Michelle decided to end it. According to her friends, Andy didn't handle the breakup well, exhibiting an intense interest in her activities and relationships. Police found that on December 19th, Andy met Michelle at the mall. When questioned, he stated that he went home afterward. His alibi was supported by his mother, confirming his presence at home that night shortly after the mall closed. Andy maintained that he and Michelle had amicably grown apart, leading to the end of their relationship. Despite lingering suspicions and rumors, the police lacked concrete evidence against Andy, and he faced no arrest or charges. After high school, he left Cedar Rapids and enlisted in the Navy. Even in his absence, lingering doubts persisted, with some believing he might be responsible for Michelle's murder and speculating on the potential emergence of sufficient evidence to prosecute him. The case eventually went cold. On June 19, 1980, six months after the murder, the police published a sketch of the alleged killer. The description of the killer was provided by two witnesses. They described a young white man, about 20 years old, 180 centimeter tall and weighing kilogram, with brown eyes and brown curly hair. In the year following the murder, hundreds of people were questioned, and about 30 of them were interrogated under hypnosis. A reward of $10,000 was offered for information about the killer. In the early stages of the investigation, police officers consulted psychics. Time passed, and the case was still unsolved. In the mid-80s, Michelle's father, Albert Martinko, sued the owners of Westdale Mall. He accused the mall management of negligence and failure to provide adequate security for customers. The case went to trial. The trial took place, and the outcome of the hearings was that the Westdale Mall management was the winning party. There was a lull in the case. Albert died in 1995, and Michelle's mom, Janet Martinko, passed away in 1998. The parents never found out who killed their daughter. It would seem that with the death of Michelle's parents, the hope of finding her killer died. But in 2005, a fresh team delved into the case. Upon reviewing the case file, detectives noticed an oversight. A previous detective had sent the blood scrapings from the gear shift of the car for testing, but the results were not documented in the file. Detectives took the initiative to obtain these results and made a significant discovery. There was male DNA present on the gear shift. Furthermore, the blood spot on Michelle's dress contained a complete male DNA profile that matched the DNA profile identified on the gear shift. To further investigate, the blood samples were submitted to CODIS, the nationwide database containing DNA profiles of individuals convicted of crimes. However, no match was found in the database, adding a layer of complexity to the ongoing investigation. Nevertheless, the investigation persisted, prompting a re-evaluation of individuals in Cedar Rapids through renewed interviews and the collection of DNA samples. Andy was approached by the police to provide a DNA sample, a request he willingly fulfilled. Upon analysis, his DNA did not match, leading to his exclusion as a suspect. After nearly three decades, Andy was ultimately vindicated and officially cleared of any involvement in the case. In 2015, Matt Denlinger assumed the role of lead detective and sought assistance from Virginia's Parabon Nano Labs. The objective was to generate a visual representation of the potential suspect using the available DNA sample. Through their analysis, they concluded that the suspect was probably a white male with blonde hair and blue eyes. Various sketches were created, each offering a slightly different depiction of how the suspect might have appeared at the time of Michelle's murder. Parabon also provided images of what the man might look like today. During a press conference in connection with the new information, one of the classmates, Michelle Martinko, said that the face from the new identikit is similar to the face of another of their classmates. However, 11 years earlier, DNA samples were taken from all classmates, and after the study, all suspicions were removed from them.
After the publication of a new sketch of the killer, police received more than a hundred new messages from citizens. Later, Parabon once again played a pivotal role in Michelle's case by utilizing the public national database GEDmatch. This database allows individuals to voluntarily submit their DNA for the purpose of tracing their family trees. The search on GEDmatch yielded a breakthrough when a relative of the killer was identified, Brandy Jennings residing in Vancouver, Washington. It was established that she was a distant relative, specifically a second cousin twice removed, to the male whose DNA was discovered on Michelle's dress and gear shift. With the assistance of genealogical records, birth records, gravestone records and internet searches, law enforcement pieced together Brandy's family tree. Collaborating with Parabon, the focus narrowed down to three brothers residing in Iowa, Kenneth Burns, Donald Burns, and Jerry Burns. In October 2018, police discreetly obtained DNA samples from the brothers without alerting them to the ongoing investigation into Michelle's murder. Through surveillance, they acquired a straw used by one brother, two straws from another, and discovered a toothbrush in the trash used by the third brother. These samples were sent for testing to determine if any matched the DNA profile on file. The results identified Jerry Burns as an exact match, and it was revealed that he was 25 years old at the time of Michelle's murder. On December 19, 2018, investigators went to Burns' office to interview him. He refused to voluntarily hand over a sample of his DNA, but was forced to provide it when investigators showed a search warrant. His hands were examined for scars that may have been from the attack on the girl. Burns claimed he did not know Martinko and was elsewhere at the time of her murder. Although he did not directly deny involvement in her murder, he found no explanation for why his DNA was at the crime scene. According to investigators, Burns expressed little to no emotion when questioned, even when he was informed of his arrest. When asked if he had killed anyone that night in 1979, Burns repeatedly replied, Test the DNA. A repeat, now official DNA test showed a 100% match to blood from the murder scene. Jerry Lynn Burns was charged with first-degree murder. He never pleaded guilty. Burns' trial was scheduled for October 14, 2019, but in September, his attorneys requested a postponement so they could have time to gather information and interview witnesses. The defense also asked that the trial be moved from nearly the most populous county in Lynn County. The attorneys attributed this to the tremendous amount of attention the case has garnered over the past 40 years and the fact that many people have developed a bias in the case. The prosecution did not resist these demands, so the trial was moved to February 10th, 2020 in Scott County, the third most populous county in Iowa. At the preliminary hearing, Burns' attorneys argued that police officers acted illegally when they took DNA from Burns' blood tube without a warrant. However, the judge ruled that the discarded item could not be recognized as private property. The defense also requested that Burns' cell phone search history not be shown at trial. Investigators examined his phone's search queries in 2018 and found that he regularly visited websites that showed blonde women being assaulted and strangled. The judge ruled the browser history could not be used in court because of the fact that the murder and those queries were separated by decades. Jury recruitment lasted two days. After that, the trial began on February 12, 2020. The prosecution insisted that the DNA profiles were so unique that no two matching profiles existed in nature. The medical examiner who performed the autopsy and the investigators who conducted the original investigation described how the case was investigated in those years. All of them were already retired. The defense attorney insisted that the evidence was improperly packaged that different items, clothing, should not be kept in the same safe bag. The prosecution showed a video of Burns' interrogation in which he denied being at the crime scene the night of Martinko's murder and that he could not explain how his DNA ended up at the crime scene. The defense brought in only one witness, a DNA expert, but with no relevant training. He testified that gross errors were made in the collection of evidence. 
He stated that Byrne's DNA could have gotten on Michelle's clothes sometime earlier through airborne droplets. In turn, the prosecution called a certified expert who refuted all of this testimony. On February 24, 2020, following three hours of deliberation, the jury rendered a verdict of guilty against Jerry Lynn Burns for the first-degree murder of Michelle Martinko. Under Iowa law, a conviction for first-degree murder carries a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole. On May 29, 2020, Burns' legal representatives filed a motion seeking a new trial, contending that his constitutional and state rights were violated and asserting that the court erred in rejecting the request to suppress evidence. Subsequently, on August 7, 2020, Jerry Lynn Burns received a life sentence without parole. In September 2020, Burns initiated the appeal process by filing a notice of appeal. On March 31, 2023, the Iowa Supreme Court dismissed Jerry Lynn Burns' appeal, thereby affirming his conviction. The motive for the murder remains unknown. On November 16, 2012, a distressing 911 call was received by the dispatch center in Lake County, Ohio. The caller, a highly agitated teenage girl, struggled to communicate due to extreme distress. Eventually, it became clear that she was reporting that her older sister was attacking their mother. Law enforcement quickly responded to the residence where they encountered the frantic caller. She explained that her older sister, 18-year-old Sabrina Zunik, was stabbing their mother. Upon their arrival, Sabrina emerged from the house holding a bloodied knife. Police demanded she drop the weapon and she complied. Inside the residence, a gruesome scene awaited them. Lisa Marie McIntosh, born on May 20, 1971, in Reynoldsburg, Ohio, was the daughter of William and Rita McIntosh. Lisa, a single mother, had a daughter from a previous relationship. In 2006, she married Kevin Nofel, who had a son from a prior relationship. The couple welcomed their daughter in 2009. Lisa, a social worker specializing in child abuse cases with the Department of Children and Family Services, had a genuine passion for aiding others. Demonstrating their commitment to helping children, Kevin and Lisa decided to become foster parents. A friend of Lisa noted, when she had foster children, she treated them like her own. She made sure she went the extra mile to be a good parent. In the summer of 2011, Sabrina Zunik, aged 16 at the time, became part of their household. Sabrina Zunik was born on October 27, 1994, in the vicinity of Cleveland, Ohio. Her upbringing was marked by significant challenges, as both of her parents grappled with alcohol and substance abuse issues, leading to a highly unstable home environment. Sabrina's early experiences were marred by the criminal troubles of her parents, and even during her infancy, she was exposed to substances like vodka in her bottle to induce sleep. These circumstances contributed to Sabrina developing behavioral and mental health issues, including ADHD, oppositional defiance disorder, bipolar disorder, anxiety, and depression. Following the removal from her parents' custody, Sabrina went to live with her grandmother. Unfortunately, her grandmother's declining health coincided with Sabrina's teenage years, and her rebellious behavior became challenging for her grandmother to handle. At the age of 14, Sabrina entered the foster care system, experiencing placements in various homes and group settings before ultimately being placed with Lisa and Kevin Nofel in 2011. Under the care of Kevin and Lisa, Sabrina made strides in turning her life around. She began attending school regularly, achieved good grades, and aspired to become a massage therapist. Sabrina seamlessly integrated into the family, forming positive connections with the two girls and actively participating in school. When she reached the age of 18 and was eligible to leave foster care, Sabrina opted to stay with Lisa and Kevin to complete her education, expressing contentment in their home. However, the tragic question arises. What drove Sabrina to fatally stab her foster mother in the presence of Lisa's two young daughters? 
On the fateful evening of November 16, 2012, while Kevin was away working as a truck driver, Lisa was at home with the children. During the night, the teenage and three-year-old daughters heard their mother's screams and discovered Sabrina repeatedly stabbing Lisa. In the midst of the horrifying scene, the younger child sought refuge in a closet while Lisa's teenage daughter desperately pleaded with Sabrina to stop the assault and promptly called 911. The situation was described as absolutely chaotic, with the distraught caller informing the police that her sister was fatally stabbing their mother. At the scene, Lisa Neufeld was pronounced dead, and Sabrina was arrested on the spot, and the murder weapon, a 15-inch knife with a 9-inch blade, convex and serrated, lacking a hilt, was recovered from the house. Notably, Sabrina did not dispute her responsibility for the act, acknowledging that she was the one who stabbed Lisa to death. Despite the disturbing nature of the murder, the police were troubled by the brutality of the attack on Lisa Nofel, who had opened her home to care for a teenager. The assault involved almost 200 stab wounds, reflecting a vicious and violent act. Lisa's husband, 42-year-old Kevin Nofel, who worked as a truck driver and was away in Michigan at the time, was notified by the police about Lisa's death. Kevin contacted 911, inquiring about the well-being of the girls, and was advised to pick them up from the police department. Kevin retrieved them at 5 a.m. that morning. Over the next 10 months, law enforcement worked diligently to piece together the puzzle surrounding the crime. Investigation findings pointed to a shift in the dynamics of the Nofel household around December 2011. Sabrina Zunich, initially content in the home, began to have conflicts with Lisa. Jealousy emerged as a significant factor, with Sabrina expressing resentment towards Lisa, accusing her of favoring Haley and Megan, the two younger girls in the family. The question loomed. Could these tensions have motivated Sabrina to commit the heinous act of killing Lisa? Several months after her arrest, Sabrina made an offer to cooperate with the police in exchange for a potential parole possibility after 30 years, as opposed to a life sentence without parole. In her statements, Sabrina disclosed a shocking claim. She alleged to have had a sexual relationship with her foster father, Kevin. According to Sabrina, this relationship commenced in the spring of 2012, and she asserted that it was Kevin's idea to plot and execute the murder of Lisa. Following Sabrina's arrest, Kevin Nofel faced charges related to the murder of his wife, Lisa. He was accused of conspiracy to commit aggravated murder, complicity to aggravated murder, and six counts of sexual battery. Kevin entered a plea of not guilty. During the trial, which focused on Kevin's charges exclusively, Sabrina, who had pleaded guilty, agreed to testify as a witness for the prosecution against Kevin. The prosecution's case asserted that while there was no dispute over Sabrina being the one who physically stabbed Lisa to death, they contended that Kevin was aware of and involved in planning the murder. The prosecution argued that Kevin desired to end his relationship with Lisa as indicated by statements made to friends about a potential divorce. They further claimed that Kevin stood to gain financially from Lisa's death due to the existence of multiple insurance policies. During the trial, the prosecution presented evidence suggesting a change in Lisa Nofel's behavior leading up to her tragic death. Testimony from Lisa's co-worker indicated that Lisa seemed distracted and was making an effort to stay focused in the months before her murder. She also mentioned delivering food to Kevin the day after Lisa's death, noting that his demeanor appeared normal, and she observed a picture of Sabrina on the refrigerator. Kevin's apparent lack of emotional response was further highlighted when she saw him at Lisa's funeral, describing him as emotionless. Another co-worker testified that Lisa underwent a noticeable change in 2012. Lisa began taking private calls away from her desk and these calls appeared to upset her. When she spoke to Kevin the day after Lisa's murder, he remarked that making up $50,000, equivalent to Lisa's salary, would be a significant challenge. The prosecution detailed Kevin's behavior upon discovering Lisa's death by calling witnesses to the stand. Police officers involved in the case described Kevin as calm during their interactions. 
patrolman, who met Kevin a few hours after Lisa's death in the police station lobby, noted that Kevin seemed relatively calm during that encounter. Detective Brian Jackson from the Willoughby Hills Police Department testified during the trial, recounting an interaction with Kevin the day after Lisa's murder. Kevin expressed a desire to enter the house, and Detective Jackson advised against it, explaining that the scene had not been cleaned. Despite the gruesome circumstances, Kevin exhibited no visible emotion and insisted on seeing the scene for himself, stating that he had encountered similar situations multiple times. The prosecution presented a case concerning the insurance money, revealing that Kevin had collected insurance funds following Lisa's death. Testimonies emphasized Kevin's swift actions on the very morning of Lisa's murder. It was disclosed that Kevin had called Lisa's workplace to inquire about the necessary paperwork for making a claim on Lisa's life insurance policy with the union. Jill Reynolds, a benefits specialist at Gordon Food Services, where Kevin was employed as a transit driver, testified that on the day Lisa was killed, Kevin contacted her to report Lisa's death and expressed his intention to file an insurance claim. This information was crucial in establishing a timeline of Kevin's actions and decisions in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy, contributing to the prosecution's narrative regarding the financial implications surrounding Lisa's death. The prosecution informed the court that Kevin filed multiple insurance claims on November 16th, including a $250,000 life policy for Lisa Nofel. This policy, issued on May 16th, 2012, covered her life. Christopher Eddy, a team leader at Guardian Life Insurance Company, stated that Guardian Life, which provides insurance for Cuyahoga children and family services, issued a check for $250,000 to Kevin as payment for the claim. Kevin received $150,000 from Farmers Insurance for a term life insurance policy purchased in 2009 for Lisa. Following Lisa's death, Kevin altered the insurance policy on the property, changing it from renters to homeowners insurance and adding a swimming pool. Kevin also acquired automobile insurance for a 2013 cruise, a 2011 Malibu, and two campers. He utilized the funds not only to settle his home mortgage, but also to purchase new cars and a residence in Florida, along with funding flying lessons. In total, Lisa held nearly $800,000 in life insurance policies, all of which Kevin collected. During the trial, the prosecution called Sabrina as a witness, who testified that her relationship with her foster father, Kevin, began in the spring of 2012. In her testimony before the court, Sabrina recounted that Kevin typically drove her to Willoughby South High School, and during these rides, they engaged in sexual activities. She stated that Kevin explained he couldn't divorce Lisa due to concerns about sharing custody of Haley. According to Sabrina, the notion of killing Lisa originated as a small idea. Kevin would occasionally text her expressing his dislike for Lisa and conveyed the idea that once Lisa was out of the picture, they could purchase their own home, live together, and Sabrina could attend college while taking on a maternal role for the children. Sabrina informed the court that she initially approached her friend Autumn Pavlik in early October, inquiring about finding someone to kill her foster mother. Autumn testified. She asked me if I was able to get her a hitman. She said that they were going to get a divorce and she was worth more dead than alive. However, Sabrina ultimately decided to handle the situation herself. She testified that on November 15, 2012, Kevin drove her to school, but upon parking, he began crying. Sabrina claimed that Kevin revealed they had a severe fight with Lisa the previous night and that he would contemplate suicide if Lisa wasn't dead. Sabrina told the court, I was scared for him because I had fallen in love with him. In response, Sabrina assured Kevin that she would take on the responsibility of killing Lisa, and less than 24 hours later, Lisa was dead. The prosecution presented Dr. Joseph Andrew Filo, a forensic pathologist affiliated with the Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office, to provide testimony regarding the severe injuries sustained by Lisa. Dr. Filo oversaw the autopsy of Lisa. According to Dr. Filo's testimony, Lisa suffered a fatal injury in the mandible, jaw region, 
penetrating deeply enough to sever the carotid artery connected to the brain. Another lethal wound was identified in her breast, penetrating through and causing the collapse of the underlying lung. Dr. Philo described several cuts on Lisa's body as intricate and complex, suggesting that the knife involved either twisted upon entry or the body was in a twisting motion. Notably, one of Lisa's fingers and one thumb were nearly severed. Defensive wounds were also evident on Lisa's body. Dr. Philo concluded that the cause of death was attributed to multiple stab and incised wounds, at least 178 in total, of head and neck, torso and extremities with musculoskeletal, vascular, and visceral injuries. The brutality of the assault was underscored by the fact that the knife used had become bent due to the extreme violence inflicted during the attack. The defense asserted that Kevin was not guilty and placed sole responsibility for Lisa's death on Sabrina. They emphasized the absence of physical evidence supporting a sexual relationship between Kevin and Sabrina, highlighting that the prosecution solely relied on Sabrina's testimony, which they argued was unreliable given her agreement to a plea deal for a reduced sentence. The defense contended that Sabrina's motive for killing Lisa was rooted in a conversation two weeks prior to the tragedy. According to their case, Lisa informed Sabrina that she needed to move out by January 1, 2013. Kevin chose not to testify during the trial. The court was informed that despite the inability to recover text messages or phone call records between Sabrina and Kevin, official records revealed a substantial amount of communication 1491 texts or calls exchanged between their cell phones from November 1, 2012 to November 16, 2012. Notably, there were 78 calls or texts documented from 7.12 p.m. on November 15 to 12.48 a.m. on November 16, just half an hour before Lisa's tragic death. After nearly 10 hours of deliberation, the jury reached a verdict, finding Kevin guilty on all 11 counts. The charges included six counts of sexual battery, three counts of complicity to commit aggravated murder, and two counts of conspiracy to commit aggravated murder. Subsequently, Kevin received a life sentence in prison with the chance of parole after 30 years. Sabrina, having pleaded guilty to aggravated murder, was also sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. The legal proceedings concluded with both individuals facing significant penalties for their roles in the tragic events. Hence, at present, Kevin remains behind bars at the Lake Erie Correctional Institution in Connaught, Ohio, with an expected parole date of 2043, while Sabrina is incarcerated at the Dayton Correctional Institution in Dayton, Ohio, with an expected parole date of 2042. On the 29th of September, 2015, a Tuesday, Kelly Clayton, aged 35, was residing at her residence in Elmira, New York, United States, accompanied by her two children, her seven-year-old daughter, Charlie, and three-year-old son, Cullen. Their abode was situated on Ginnon Road within the Steuben County town of Catton. Kelly, a native of Elmira, had departed in her 20s to pursue her aspirations of becoming a model. Relinquishing her teaching profession, she secured employment as a cocktail waitress in Las Vegas, where she relished an exhilarating experience. However, upon encountering Thomas Clayton, a hockey player for the semi-professional Elmira Jackals, she returned to Elmira to embark on a life journey with him. They wedded and subsequently welcomed two children into their lives. Thomas Clayton spent four seasons playing for the Elmira Jackals hockey team, starting as a forward straight out of Niagara University. Alongside his hockey career, he ventured into entrepreneurship by establishing a fire and water damage restoration franchise called Paul Davis Emergency Services of the Southern Tier. Later, he transitioned into the role of project manager at Serve Pro, a similar franchise owned by his friend Brian Lang. Meanwhile, Kelly held a job at the Woodhouse Stadium Grill in Corning, Despite their busy schedules, they appeared to be a content family of four. On the night of September 28th, Thomas engaged in his usual Monday night poker game with friends, a routine he faithfully followed. Leaving their residence on Ginnon Road, 
he drove approximately 10 minutes to his friend's house where the game was hosted. Thomas remained at the poker game until 12.20 a.m., returning home around 12.30 a.m. Upon entering the house, he made the harrowing discovery of Kelly's lifeless body on the kitchen floor, having been brutally murdered. Immediately, Thomas dialed 911, placing the call around 12.34 a.m. Kim Bourgeois, Kelly's sister, and their mother arrived at the house within an hour of the incident. They were confronted with a gruesome crime scene marked by extensive blood spatter. Evidence suggested that Kelly was initially assaulted in her bedroom, with the violence continuing down the hallway, stairs, and culminating in the kitchen where her lifeless body was discovered. Kelly met a tragic end, having been fatally beaten with a fiberglass maul handle, succumbing to the blunt force trauma inflicted upon her. Shockingly, Kelly's children were present during the horrifying attack. Her seven-year-old daughter recounted the events to the police, describing a robber in the house that night. She provided a chilling recollection of witnessing her mother's savage assault and hearing her desperate pleas for escape. Kelly's daughter recounted to the police that she witnessed a man harming her mother. According to her testimony during the night, an intruder entered their home and began assaulting her mother with a pipe-like object. She described the scene as chaotic, with blood present even on her door and the floor. The assailant pursued her mother downstairs while she screamed at her to flee. The attack persisted downstairs, with the child witnessing the assailant striking her mother until she collapsed. In a heart-wrenching moment, she hugged her mother's leg as she lay suffering on the ground. Kelly's daughter embraced her mother tightly as she lay on the kitchen floor in her final moments. Afterwards, she hurried upstairs to check on her younger brother. When questioned by the police, Kelly's daughter described the assailant as wearing dark jeans, a long-sleeved shirt, and a mask. When asked about his build, she likened him to her father in size and noted that his eyes appeared similar. Despite no visible signs of forced entry or indication of a robbery, a family member at the scene suggested the police investigate a man named Michael Beard. Beard, a former employee of one of Thomas's businesses who had been terminated and was facing eviction from his rented apartment owned by Thomas, came under scrutiny. Inside the house, law enforcement personnel interpreted the scene as possibly stemming from a domestic violence incident, leading them to request Thomas's presence at the police station for questioning. Police verified Thomas's alibi and found evidence supporting his presence at a poker game on the night of the incident, confirmed by witnesses at the game and his GPS data. However, upon deeper investigation into Thomas's alibi, Linda Miller, a woman who attended the poker game with him, informed the police that Thomas had used her phone approximately 90 minutes before Kelly's body was discovered. Although Thomas had deleted this call, phone records revealed that he had contacted Michael Beard. As a result of this new evidence, Thomas was charged with second-degree murder. Phone records revealed a pattern of frequent calls and texts between Thomas and Michael. Subsequent analysis of cell phone records indicated that shortly after Thomas contacted Michael on the night of the murder, Michael became mobile. Police began to suspect that Kelly's death might have been orchestrated as part of a murder-for-hire scheme. Adding weight to their suspicions, investigators found that just a year prior to Kelly's murder, Thomas had doubled her life insurance policy, now valued at $1 million. Moreover, it came to light that Thomas was engaged in multiple extramarital affairs, with some of the women alleging that he had expressed fears of losing his assets in a divorce. During questioning, Michael confessed to police that Thomas had hired him to carry out the murder in exchange for $10,000 in cash. He disclosed the whereabouts of the murder weapon, a mall handle, located off State Route 225 in Southport. Additionally, Michael revealed that Thomas's house keys were submerged in a shallow creek in Elmira Heights, and a bag containing the clothes he wore on the night of the murder could be found in Elmira. Michael reiterated his admission of guilt before a grand jury. Both Thomas and Michael were indicted on charges of first-degree murder and underwent separate trials, with Michael's trial proceeding first. Despite his initial confession, Michael pleaded not guilty during his trial 
and recanted his statements to the police. He claimed that Thomas had tasked him with setting fire to the house to claim insurance money. But upon arriving at the scene, he discovered Kelly's lifeless body and fled in panic. However, besides his confession, compelling evidence linked Michael to the murder. Physical evidence directly tied him to the crime scene, including the murder weapon, house keys, and the clothing he wore that night, with DNA matching Kelly's daughter's description found on the clothes. According to testimonies presented in court, Michael entered the Clayton residence that fateful night using a key, gaining access through the garage door before proceeding upstairs. Kelly was asleep in her bedroom when Michael launched his attack, striking her twice with the mall handle. Despite Kelly's attempt to defend herself, she fled towards her daughter's bedroom at the end of the hallway, only to fall down the stairs and collide with the landing wall in her desperate bid to escape. Despite her efforts to evade him, Kelly was pursued by Michael into the dining room and eventually the kitchen, where he ruthlessly continued his assault, inflicting vicious and brutal blows to her head and face. Michael was convicted of first-degree murder and received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In contrast, Thomas Clayton's trial was more complex than Michael's. While direct evidence directly linked Michael to the crime, Thomas's case relied solely on circumstantial evidence. Thomas maintained his innocence and pleaded not guilty. The prosecution argued that Thomas desired to end his marriage to Kelly, feeling constrained by their relationship due to his numerous affairs and gambling habits. They contended that Thomas sought the freedom to live as he pleased and saw Kelly as an obstacle. It was their assertion that he enlisted Michael to murder Kelly, not only to achieve this freedom, but also to benefit financially from the insurance policy. Thomas allegedly confided in some of the women with whom he was having affairs, expressing concerns about divorcing Kelly for fear of losing his assets. During the trial, several women whom the prosecution claimed Thomas was involved with testified and recounted disparaging remarks he made about Kelly to them. The court was also informed that Thomas had made a troubling statement to Kelly's niece, implying an ominous future. This is going to be the last Christmas with me around and us being together as a family. The prosecution faced the challenge of demonstrating to the jury the connection between Michael and Thomas, particularly establishing how they were acquainted. While it was undisputed that Michael worked for Thomas, the key was to present sufficient evidence indicating that Thomas had hired Michael to carry out Kelly's murder. Evidence presented in court revealed that just 12 days prior to Kelly's murder, Michael's employment under Thomas was terminated, resulting in financial strain that led to difficulties in paying rent for the apartment he rented from Thomas. Notably, Michael lacked personal transportation and a driver's license. Additionally, a few days before Kelly's murder, Thomas purchased a bicycle for Michael, which became his means of transportation. Throughout this crucial 12-day period, Thomas and Michael maintained frequent telephone contact, which raised suspicions regarding the nature of their relationship and the circumstances surrounding Kelly's murder. Six days prior to Kelly's murder, an individual from Thomas's company contacted a nearby storage facility, inquiring about the coverage of surveillance cameras outside the premises, specifically inquiring if the company's property fell within their surveillance range. Three days following this inquiry, Thomas himself reached out to an acquaintance, questioning whether surveillance cameras were present outside an inn located in Elmira. Although the acquaintance was uncertain and offered to investigate further, Thomas dismissed the matter, indicating there was no need for further inquiry. Interestingly, this inn later became the location where Michael would discard certain items from the night of the murder. On the night of the murder, Thomas attended a poker game, but notably he did not use his own vehicle for transportation. Instead, he utilized one of the company's trucks. Earlier that day, Thomas and one of his employees had swapped trucks to facilitate the unloading of an ATV, highlighting a deviation from Thomas's usual transportation routine. The jury was presented with surveillance footage from cameras at the storage unit adjacent to Thomas's company, capturing pivotal movements of vehicles. Notably, Thomas's personal truck, a maroon vehicle, was observed departing the parking lot around noon. Subsequently, the maroon truck, identifiable as the one Thomas was driving, left at 1.09 p.m., 
and returned at 6.04 p.m. A few minutes later, it departed once more, along with another company truck. Notably, Thomas arrived at the poker game later that evening at 8 p.m., driving the same company truck that left simultaneously with the maroon truck. The prosecution argued that the maroon truck was utilized by Michael to travel to the Clayton residence. Allegedly, after Thomas's call to Michael, Michael proceeded to the Clayton house, accompanied by Mark Blandford, whom he picked up en route. Upon arriving at the Clayton residence, Michael exited the truck and entered the premises, while Mark remained in the vehicle. After approximately 15 minutes, Michael emerged from the house visibly agitated, perspiring, and carrying a mall handle. After leaving the Clayton residence, Michael and Mark returned to Elmira, where they disposed of the mall handle en route and discarded a bag of clothes into water at another location. The maroon truck, associated with Thomas, re-entered the company's parking lot at 12.55 a.m. Surveillance footage captured an individual departing the parking lot shortly thereafter, riding a bicycle. Upon returning home from the poker game and discovering Kelly's body, Thomas contacted emergency services. However, suspicions surrounding his involvement prompted police to request his presence at the station for questioning. Thomas, seemingly confident in his alibi, responded to the police by stating, Well, you'll know where I am because my vehicle has GPS on it. Thomas was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Thomas's appeal was unsuccessful, and his conviction for first-degree murder was upheld by the appeals court. Mark Blandford admitted guilt to second-degree manslaughter for his involvement in the crime, asserting that he was unaware of the events that would unfold that night. As part of a plea agreement, he received a sentence of three to six years in prison and testified against Thomas. Police investigation suggested that the night of Kelly's murder may not have been the initial planned date. It was believed that Thomas intended to be out of town in Ohio during the week of September 21st, 2015, with Michael supposed to carry out the murder then. Thomas drove a company vehicle to Ohio, leaving his personal truck near Michael's residence. However, nothing occurred that week, prompting the plan to be rescheduled for the following week, resulting in Kelly's brutal murder in her own home. Not only were her children present, but her daughter witnessed the violent and vicious murder. Tony Jill Bertolet Henthorn, the daughter of Bob and Yvonne Bertolet, was born on January 10, 1962, in Jackson, Mississippi. After graduating from Trinity High School in 1980, she went on to achieve honors and magna cum laude status at the University of Mississippi Medical School in 1988. Tony's professional journey led her to work as a surgical and cosmetic ophthalmologist at Associates in Eye Care in Denver, where her excellence earned her a place in America's top ophthalmologists by the Consumer Research Council in 2006. Beyond her medical career, Tony was actively involved in her community, attending and teaching Sunday school at Cherry Hills Community Church. Tony was not only an accomplished pianist, but also possessed a beautiful voice participating in various church choirs. Her commitment to her faith extended to her insightful contributions to gotquestions.org, where she regularly shared her perspectives on Christianity. Harold and Tony Henthorne first connected online in 1999 and swiftly tied the knot after a mere nine months. Despite Tony's thriving career as an eye surgeon, her foremost aspiration was a fulfilling marriage and a family. This aspiration appeared to materialize when she encountered Harold, who presented himself as an affluent entrepreneur involved in fundraising for educational institutions and churches. Upon their meeting, Harold convinced Tony to relocate from Jackson, Mississippi to Colorado. Despite the challenges associated with leaving behind her family and friends in Mississippi, Tony eagerly embraced the prospect of forging a new life with her husband. The culmination of their family occurred in 2005 with the birth of their daughter, Haley. On the 29th of September 2012, a Saturday, Tony Henthorne and her spouse, Harold Henthorne, were engaged in a hiking excursion at the Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado, USA, commemorating their 12th wedding anniversary. 
Just prior to 3.30 p.m., they deviated from the trail, having lunch atop a picturesque cliff. Continuing off the designated trail, they discovered a cliff beneath their lunch spot by 4.45 p.m. In less than half an hour, Tony tragically plummeted 130 feet to the ground from the same steep cliff. At 5.54 p.m., almost 45 minutes after the fall, Harold dialed 911, reporting the incident. He informed the authorities that it took him 15 minutes to reach Tony and an additional 30 minutes to assess and relocate her. During the 911 call, Harold disclosed their location near the mountain summit, expressing concern about Tony's weakened breathing and head injury. Requesting a helicopter, he later spoke to another operator, mentioning that he had created a fire in a rock enclosure and observed a decline in Tony's breathing, eventually confirming its cessation. Harold, guided by the operator, attempted chest compressions. In a subsequent 911 call, Harold inquired about the arrival of assistance. The operator informed him that the ranger was calling out for him, but Harold claimed not to have heard any calls. The EMT ranger arrived around 8 p.m., conducting an examination that unfortunately revealed Tony's demise. Authorities interviewed Harold regarding the circumstances of Tony's death. Despite claiming he did not witness Tony's fall, stating he was engrossed in reading text messages and only saw a blur, Harold provided conflicting accounts to others. In one instance, he asserted that Tony had ventured too close to the edge, while to someone else, he contended that Tony was attempting to take pictures and slipped. Upon receiving the tragic news of Tony's demise, her parents, Bob and Yvonne Bertolet, had a stark reaction. Bob immediately asserted, he pushed her. Initially perceived as an accidental death, it became evident that Tony's parents harbored concerns about her well-being for a considerable period. When Tony first met Harold, she was a high achiever and a self-assured woman. However, her confidence waned after moving to Colorado with Harold, who gradually assumed control over her life. Even during phone calls from her parents, Harold would intercept and put the conversations on speakerphone. Tony's parents grew apprehensive, suspecting that Harold might not be the prosperous businessman he claimed to be, possibly relying on Tony's income. Yet, it wasn't just his financial situation that troubled them. They felt he isolated Tony from her family and friends. A sense of unease persisted, prompting Yvonne to seek conversations with Tony. However, every attempt to discuss Harold's job, the couple's financial situation, or his pervasive control over Tony's life was met with the same response from Tony. Raising these issues would lead to consequences for her. One particular incident intensified their worries to the extent that they hoped Tony would sever ties with him. During their visits to Harold's cabin in West Denver, an alarming episode unfolded. While Haley was asleep, Harold requested Tony's assistance in clearing debris. During this task, something struck the back of Tony's neck with such force that she required hospitalization. Harold later claimed that a large piece of lumber had fallen off the porch and hit her. This incident heightened Tony's parents' concern for her safety, leading them to implore her not to be alone with him. Upon investigating Tony's death, the police uncovered disconcerting details that raised suspicions. Numerous inconsistencies emerged in Harold's accounts of the hike, the area, and the events of that fateful day. Harold informed a ranger that he and Tony had initially planned to hike the Bear Lake Trail, a half mile of paved walking with no elevation gain. A suitable choice for Tony, who had undergone three knee surgeries and could no longer ski. However, Harold later told the ranger that they opted for the Deer Mountain Trail to avoid crowds. This trail spanned three miles, ascending 1,200 feet from its trailhead to the 10, 200-foot summit. Harold asserted to the ranger that he was unfamiliar with the area and had been there only once. However, police, scrutinizing his phone records, discovered that he had visited the location eight or nine times in the six weeks leading up to that day. Additionally, he exhibited knowledge of the specific site, including the steep cliff where Tony fell. Despite mentioning seeing a white sheet on the cliff, it had been removed by the Park Service a week prior to Tony's fall. Inside his car, the police found a park map with a pink X marking the spot where Tony fell. 
the police found Harold's 911 call troubling. Despite claiming a low phone battery, which limited his ability to speak, he proceeded to make 22 calls and sent or received 98 text messages. Notably, one text message directed a friend to pick him up from Estes Park with detailed instructions on the route to take. The police uncovered a disturbing pattern when they found that Harold had taken out multiple life insurance policies on Tony's life. Notably, he had recently made himself the beneficiary of a life insurance annuity that originally designated his daughter Haley as the beneficiary. This, however, was not an isolated incident. The investigation revealed that Harold had a history of benefiting from life insurance policies, as he had also been the beneficiary of a policy on his first wife. In May 1995, Harold was married to a woman named Sandra Lynn Henthorne. On the 6th of May 1995, the couple was driving along a remote highway near Sedalia, Colorado, on a cold and dark night. During the nighttime drive, their Jeep Cherokee experienced a tire issue, prompting them to stop and change the tire. Lynn, Harold's first wife, went underneath the Jeep, which was supported by two jacks, to perform the tire change. Tragically, the Jeep fell on top of Lynn, resulting in her being crushed. Harold flagged down passing motorists and sought assistance, but Lynn did not survive. Initially ruled as an accidental death, the cause was determined to be traumatic asphyxiation from being crushed under the car, resulting in fatal internal injuries. Following Tony's death, a re-examination of Lynn's case revealed errors made during the initial investigation, with several matters left unaddressed. Harold, being the sole witness to Lynn's tragic incident, had provided statements to the police that were riddled with inconsistencies. Discrepancies included contradictory claims about the direction they were driving that night, with Harold stating they were heading both east and west. Additionally, he provided conflicting details about a restaurant stop before Lynn's death, at times suggesting they had already dined there and on other occasions stating they were en route to the restaurant. Notably, authorities failed to verify Harold's accounts with the restaurant to confirm their presence that night. Further inconsistencies emerged such as conflicting statements about the condition of the tire. Harold alternately described it as flat and spongy. Notably, there was a partial print discovered on the wheel well above the missing tire, where Lynn was changing it. However, this print was never compared to Harold's shoes at the time to determine a potential match. The position of the print suggested it could have resulted from someone kicking the car, an action that might have caused the Jeep to fall and crush Lynn. Unfortunately, this lead was not pursued during the original investigation. Prior to Lynn's tragic death, Harold had acquired a substantial life insurance policy on her. While he informed the police that he would receive $300,000, an independent verification would have revealed that he was actually slated to receive double that amount. This increase was the result of a modification Harold made to the policy shortly before Lynn's death changing it to provide double compensation in the event of her demise resulting from an accident. Moreover, the investigative file highlighted an encounter with a mechanic who drove by Harold and Lynn around 9.30 p.m., offering assistance. Harold declined the mechanic's offer. The file also referenced an individual named Patricia Montoya. A day after Lynn's death, Patricia contacted the police and inquired, Did you arrest the husband yet? Patricia recounted to the police that she and her family were on their way home in a car around 10 p.m. when Harold flagged them down, seeking help. Despite their attempts to locate a phone to call 911, they couldn't find one, so they proceeded to pull Lynn out from under the car. Harold vociferously objected to their intervention, shouting at them not to touch her. Even when they attempted CPR, Harold resisted and refused to provide his coat to keep Lynn warm. Lynn was eventually airlifted to a nearby hospital, but succumbed to internal injuries during surgery. Curiously, no charges were filed against Harold in connection with Lynn's death. However, in Tony's case, Harold faced first-degree murder charges. The prosecution contended that he deliberately, and with premeditation, pushed Tony over the cliff to her death. To substantiate their case, the prosecution presented the map with the marked X, indicating the spot where Tony fell.
The jury also heard about phone records placing Harold at the park multiple times in the weeks leading up to Tony's death. The court further delved into the 911 call. Given the remote location with poor cellular service and no nearby aid stations where Tony fell, help didn't arrive until 8 p.m. Despite the call being made around 6 p.m., the prosecution argued that during this critical period, Harold took no meaningful action to assist his wife. To support this, the prosecution called Julie Sullivan, the emergency services dispatcher, to testify that she used a standardized protocol to guide individuals through CPR over the phone and that she had dealt with approximately 240 similar calls before speaking with Harold. Julie testified that her conversation with Harold was unusual. In my experience, when I'm doing CPR with somebody, guiding them through it, even if they are experienced people, nurses and other people on the scene, they're extremely out of breath. I found it unusual that he wasn't letting me know when he was completed with an instruction I had given him. A lot of, you know, every other call I've been with, the person wants to know immediately what to do next. Okay, I did my 30. What do I do next? What do I do next? That was very unusual, and I didn't feel like he was doing the CPR. Most people, because of the exertion of doing the CPR, the compressions, and also giving the breaths, it's very exhausting. I need to know when you're complete with it, so we can go ahead and go on to the next instruction, and he was not letting me know after he completed every instruction I'd given him, so I was prompting him to let me know. And also we did have an open line. On all the other CPR calls that I've done through my career, I can hear them as they are doing the compressions on the patient, because it's a lot of breathing, it's a heavy breathing, it's very exhausting, and it's hard to even get out and talk back. They have a hard time talking with me because they are so out of breath because of the exertion. Julie Sullivan, the emergency services dispatcher, testified in court that based on her experience, she did not believe Harold was actually performing CPR during the 911 call. The medical examiner's findings further undermined Harold's claims. There were no signs of the typical abrasions, contusions, or anterior rib fractures associated with CPR. In fact, there was no indication that any CPR attempts had been made. Tony's fall had been partially broken by a tree at the base of the cliff, which resulted in scalp and tissue being torn from her skull. The medical examiner detailed Tony's extensive injuries, revealing severe brain hemorrhaging, a fractured neck, blunt force trauma to the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Broken ribs, deformed chest with lacerations and bleeding in the liver and lungs, and pale skin indicative of significant blood loss. In presenting the case to the jury, the prosecution drew parallels between Tony's death and the unusual circumstances surrounding Harold's first wife, Lynn. The court allowed the prosecution to introduce Lynn's case due to the striking similarities. Following the same principle, the prosecution also disclosed the incident Tony had recounted to her mother that occurred at Harold's cabin. The jury was presented with another disturbing incident involving Tony that occurred in May 2011. Tony suffered a neck injury when she was struck in the back of the neck and upper back with a large wooden beam. Similar to the other incidents, this occurred in a remote and secluded location. Around 10 p.m. that night, Harold was cleaning the deck of their cabin and asked Tony to assist him, leading to the unfortunate incident with the beam. Harold provided inconsistent accounts of the events to different individuals. He initially told paramedics that he threw the beam, but later informed a doctor that it had fallen off the deck. Yet another version was shared with a friend, where Harold claimed he dropped the beam on Tony when he slipped from a ladder she was holding. Adding to the complexity of the situation, a nurse's note in Tony's file suggested that she was underneath the deck at the time when the beam fell. The prosecution built its case around a clear motive, financial gain through life insurance policies. Harold held three $1.5 million life insurance policies on Tony, along with a $205,000 annuity, making him the beneficiary of more than $4.7 million upon Tony's death. A month prior to Tony's demise in April 2011, 
Harold made himself the beneficiary of a $205,000 life insurance annuity purchased by Tony's parents for their granddaughter, Haley. In a strategic move, the defense opted not to call any witnesses to provide evidence, relying on the belief that the prosecution had failed to establish its case. However, this gamble did not pay off. After ten and a half hours of deliberation, the jury found Harold guilty of murder, leading to a life sentence in prison. A disturbing pattern emerged as it was revealed that Harold had the bodies of both Tony and Lynn cremated immediately after their deaths, scattering their ashes in the same location. Donna Ellen Brown was born November 10, 1963, in Florida. Donna was the oldest of three girls. She was beautiful, smart, and successful in her career as an operating room technician. She met Mark Winger, a nuclear engineer, and they married in a traditional Jewish ceremony in 1989. Donna and Mark seemed to be a picture-perfect couple. They were successful and owned a nice home in a nice neighborhood. However, not every story ends perfectly like the beginning. On the 29th of August, 1995, a Tuesday, Mark Winger contacted 911 at 4.27 p.m., reporting an incident where a man was harming his wife. Mark, residing in Springfield, Illinois, with his 31-year-old wife Donna Winger, informed the dispatcher that he had shot the man. Upon the police's arrival, they discovered Donna in a critical condition, having sustained seven blows to the head with a hammer. A man, identified as 27-year-old Roger Harrington, was found in a critical state beside Donna, having suffered two gunshot wounds to the head. Both victims were promptly taken to the hospital, where Roger succumbed shortly after arrival, and Donna passed away a few minutes later without regaining consciousness. The police secured the residence, finding no signs of forced entry. Mark, visibly distressed, explained to the police that he shot the man upon witnessing the attack on his wife. Mark detailed that he was in the basement on the treadmill when he heard noises upstairs, prompting him to investigate. He discovered their adopted baby Bailey on the bed in the master bedroom, but found no trace of Donna. Upon hearing more noises downstairs, Mark retrieved his handgun from the bedroom nightstand and proceeded towards the dining room. According to Mark, he observed a man wielding a hammer in the hallway, assaulting Donna. Mark shot the man, and upon an attempt to rise, Mark fired a second shot. The police located the blood-covered hammer used in the assault, which belonged to both Donna and Mark. Additionally, a .45 caliber semi-automatic handgun, confirmed by Mark as the weapon used, was found in the house. When Mark inquired about the identity of the man who attacked his wife, the police confirmed it was Roger. Mark then stated, That's the man who has been harassing my wife this week. As per Mark's account, Donna had traveled to visit her parents in Florida six days prior. Her mother dropped her off at the airport, and a driver hired through a limousine company in St. Louis, Missouri, named Roger, transported her back to Springfield. According to Mark, Donna shared that during the two-hour drive, Roger was excessively talkative and exhibited flirtatious behavior, expressing a preference for older women and extending invitations to intimate parties. The conversation took a darker turn when he disclosed hearing a disturbing voice named Dom instructing him to harm people. Mark informed the police, stating, The guy scared her. She said that he was very frightening. He said things about killing people, setting car bombs, mutilating people. Upon Donna's return to Springfield, she informed her family about the unsettling encounter, expressing fear and discomfort due to the alarming conversation and erratic driving. Mark recounted to the police that despite safely reaching home, the situation persisted. Donna received numerous peculiar phone calls, and based on the timing, she suspected Roger as the caller. In the house, the police discovered a note describing Donna's unsettling car ride. Mark also informed the police that he reported the incident to the limousine company where Roger was employed, resulting in Roger's suspension, which Mark believed might have escalated the situation. The police discovered Roger's car parked outside the Winger house, facing the wrong direction. Upon inspection, 
they found various weapons inside, including a knife and a tire iron. Authorities concluded that Mark acted in self-defense, and they decided not to press charges considering the traumatic circumstances. The case was closed with the acknowledgement that Mark had already endured significant distress. Mark appeared profoundly affected by the events. Mark and Donna had moved to Springfield right after their wedding, where they found happiness. Donna worked at Memorial Medical Center as an operating room technician, while Mark served as an engineer for the Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety. Despite facing challenges, such as Donna's initial distress upon learning she couldn't conceive, their lives took a positive turn when a doctor informed them of a teenager willing to put her baby up for adoption. Donna and Mark gladly welcomed their adopted daughter, Bailey, on June 1, 1995. Following Donna's tragic death, Mark, now responsible for the infant Bailey, opted to stay in the same house. To help with childcare, he hired a nanny, Rebecca Simic. Unexpectedly, a few months into her employment, Rebecca discovered she was pregnant with Mark's child. They named their daughter Anna. Subsequently, Mark and Rebecca got married just over a year after Donna's passing. Mark made the decision to sell the house and severed ties with Donna's family. The new family, consisting of Mark, Rebecca, Bailey, and Anna, moved to a different town. Over time, they expanded their family further with the addition of two more children, Maggie and Ben. In 1999, Donna's close friend, Deanne Schultz, revealed to the police that she had an affair with Mark while Donna was still alive, and Mark made troubling statements that stayed with her. According to Deanne, Mark expressed, it would be easier for us to be together if Donna just died. All you'd have to do is come in and find the body. Deanne also shared disturbing information that raised concerns for the authorities. When Mark learned about Donna's unsettling experience during the car ride back to Springfield, he allegedly told Deanne that he needed to have the driver in his house. This revelation prompted the police to reopen Donna's case. However, they discovered with disappointment that some evidence had gone missing. Mark initiated a civil lawsuit against BART Transportation, seeking accountability for Donna's death due to Roger's actions. As Roger was an employee of BART Transportation at the time of Donna's death, his attorney requested access to the evidence and files for the civil suit. Despite this, the police managed to retain some files and accessed photos taken on the day of the incident. These images depicted Donna and Roger on the ground before being taken to the hospital. However, the positions of the bodies seemed inconsistent with Mark's earlier account given to the police years ago. At the time, Mark informed the police that he encountered Roger kneeling beside Donna's head, assaulting her with a hammer, prompting him to open fire. Mark claimed that Roger fell backward, and attempting to rise, Mark shot him again. According to Mark's description, Roger's position should have placed his feet near Donna's head, facing the opposite direction. However, upon reviewing the photos taken by the police upon their arrival, it appeared that both Roger and Donna were on the ground facing the same direction. This inconsistency led the police, for the first time, to entertain the suspicion that Mark might have been involved in his wife's murder. The question of why Roger was at their house on that day remained unanswered. Simultaneously, during the civil suit involving Mark, a potential explanation emerged. BART Transportation enlisted a blood spatter expert, whose analysis suggested that the blood spatter patterns indicated Mark's involvement in the deaths of both Donna and Roger. As the police delved deeper into the investigation, they uncovered additional incriminating evidence. Roger's roommate, Susan Collins, informed law enforcement that she overheard Roger arranging a meeting with someone on the day he was killed. Furthermore, a note written on a bank deposit slip inside Roger's car was discovered, containing Mark's name, address, and a specified time. Susan shared with the police that Roger had mentioned agreeing to meet Mark to resolve issues stemming from Mark's complaints about Roger's driving and the concerning conversation he had with Donna. Roger left the house at 3.30 p.m., and the note indicated a meeting time of 4.30 p.m., aligning with the prosecution's belief that Mark had asked him to come to the house at that time. 
On August 23, 2001, Mark was arrested and charged with two counts of murder. The prosecution argued that Mark was responsible for both Donna and Roger's deaths. They contended that Mark desired to remove Donna from his life, but didn't want to risk losing custody of their adopted daughter, Bailey, and therefore avoided divorce. Allegedly, Mark saw an opportunity when he learned about Donna's troubles with Roger, viewing it as a perfect chance to eliminate Donna and frame an innocent man. The prosecution proposed that Mark contacted Roger, whom he had never met before that day, and asked him to come to the house. Upon Roger's arrival, Mark allegedly let him inside and fatally shot him. The absence of forced entry at the residence supported this narrative. The prosecution further claimed that Donna, who was in the master bedroom with Bailey, heard the gunshot, went downstairs, and was subsequently beaten to death with a hammer by Mark before he called 911. To establish that Mark had lured Roger to the house, the prosecution presented the note found in Roger's car, which contained Mark's name and address. The jury learned that although Roger had weapons in his car, he didn't bring them into the house and instead used Donna's hammer in the attack. This raised questions about Roger's intentions if he had indeed gone there with the purpose of assaulting Donna. The court was also informed about the inconsistencies between the location Mark claimed Roger was in when he shot him and the photos taken on the same day, which contradicted Mark's account. Deanne's testimony played a crucial role, shedding light on the statements Mark allegedly made expressing a desire for Donna's death. The court learned that four days before the murders, on August 25, 1995, Mark had asked his co-worker, Candace Bolden, about the fate of his adopted daughter if Donna were to die. Later that day, Mark contacted Ray Duffy, the president of the transport company where Roger worked, to complain about Donna's ride. A few days after, Mark called again, seeking the driver's full name and expressing a desire to discuss the matter directly with him. During the trial, the court was informed about the severe injuries sustained by Donna and Roger. When the police arrived at the house, Donna was found lying face down on the floor, and Roger was on his back. Donna's cause of death was determined to be brain trauma, resulting from multiple blunt force injuries to the head consistent with hammer strikes. Roger died from brain trauma caused by gunshot wounds to the top left side of his head and above his left eyebrow, with additional contusions on his chest from hammer strikes. The defense contended that Roger's erratic decisions that day, including the choice of weapon and the peculiar parking of his car, indicated mental instability, a claim they asserted was evident from his behavior during the car ride with Donna. Regarding the position of the bodies and the photos, the defense argued that although Donna and Roger were critical when paramedics arrived, they weren't deceased, and the paramedics might have moved them in attempts to save their lives. However, the paramedics denied moving them before the photos were taken, and Mark did not testify during the trial. Concerning Deanne's testimony, the defense claimed she was motivated by personal feelings of rejection. While Mark admitted to having an affair with Deanne, he moved on with the nanny he hired soon after Donna's death, marrying her shortly thereafter. The defense asserted that Deanne harbored resentment for not being chosen by Mark to marry. Despite the defense's arguments, the jury found Mark guilty of two counts of first-degree murder, and he received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In 2005, while still serving time for the first-degree murder convictions, Mark became involved in a murder-for-hire plot that was thwarted. Allegedly, he attempted to orchestrate hits on Deanne for testifying against him and on Jeffrey Gelman, a childhood friend, for not posting his million-dollar bail. Investigators discovered 19 handwritten pages outlining Mark's desires for Deanne. He reportedly wanted her kidnapped and coerced into writing a statement recanting her testimony, asserting Mark's innocence before planning for her demise. Mark claimed in court that these notes merely represented a fantasy he never intended to carry out. Despite Mark's assertion, he was found guilty of solicitation of murder and received an additional 35-year prison sentence. Donna's mother, Sarah Jane, and Donna's stepfather, Ira Drescher, 
expressed their overwhelming response to the evidence against Mark, emphasizing the brutality of Donna's murder. What's so hard to understand is the way he murdered Donna was so vicious and so violent. Throughout these legal proceedings, Mark has maintained his innocence. Deanne, who provided testimony against him, was granted immunity and faced no charges as a result.